Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our broadcast tonight. This is the virtual home of Princeton Public Library on Crowdcast. My name is Janie Herman, and I am the Adult Programming Manager at the Princeton Public Library. It's my pleasure to host tonight's program, which is presented in partnership with Princeton University Press with support from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Tonight's program is When Bad Thinking Happens to Good People, and it is an author talk with Stephen Nadler and Lawrence Shapiro. Professors Nadler and Shapiro will speak and we will also have an audience Q&A. We are fortunate to have these two experts with us tonight to discuss their new book that came out at the end of August, When Bad Thinking Happens to Good People, How Philosophy Can Save Us from Ourselves. Stephen Nadler is the William H. Hay II Professor of Philosophy at the University of Wisconsin-Madison where he is also the director of the Institute for Research in the Humanities. His books include Think Least of Death, Spinoza on How to Live and Die, which he wrote with uh, Ben Nadler and Heretics, um, I'm sorry, Heretics, <laughs> The Wondrous and Dangerous Beginnings of Modern Philosophy, both from Princeton University Press. Lawrence Shapiro is the Berendt Ench Professor of Philosophy, also at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. His books include Zen and the Art of Running, the Path to Making Peace with Your Pace, and The Miracle Myth, Why Beliefs in the Resurrection and the Supernatural is Unjustified. Just a few brief housekeeping items before I bring our guest speakers on. If you'd like to buy the book, please click on the button below the video feed to find it on the website of our book partner, Labyrinth Books. You can see in the chat where I've put in information about how you can get a 10% discount. If you encounter issues with audio or video, there is a button at the bottom that you can click to get audio or video help or just put your question in the chat. If you have a question for the authors or you'd like us to get, um, to, uh, get to at the end, please put it in the Q&A box. This event is being recorded and our events will go up on the library's YouTube channel. Finally, as Crowdcast is a browser-based platform, we recommend that you close other tabs that you're not using to ensure the highest quality audiovisual experience. So with all of that out of the way, it is now my great pleasure to welcome to the screen, Stephen Nadler and Larry Shapiro. Okay, welcome. I'm gonna go and disappear here behind the scenes and let both of you take it away. All right, thanks very much. Okay. Thanks, Janie. Uh, Steve, did you wanna start? Yeah, I'll get started. Um, I'd like to start off by saying, uh, first of all, welcome. And um, here's sort of the caveat. Neither of us ever envisioned, we've never written a book like this, and we've never envisioned uh, having to write a book like this. Larry's a philosopher of mind. Uh, he's interested in the nature of mental events and philosophical issues around psychology and cognitive science. Uh, I'm a scholar of early modern philosophy, working on such 17th century thinkers as Descartes and Spinoza. Um, I think we have a, um, a presentation that should be starting right about now. So I'll wait for that to come up. Neither of us ever envisioned writing a book like this. Um, and I'm not talking about the way the book looks, but the content of the book. Um, but um, I generally work on Descartes and Spinoza, while Larry works on issues around philosophical psychology. So Larry moved to the slide with Descartes and Spinoza. There you go. However, we are both trained as philosophers, and it's as philosophers that we watch events in our community and our state, in our country and around the world with great concern and even alarm and fear. There is, of course, the global COVID-19 pandemic that is costing so many lives and taking an enormous economic toll. But what is equally and perhaps even more worrisome is another pandemic. It's a pandemic that, while not as visible as the current medical crisis, not only exacerbates its tragic effects, but wrecks havoc on a more extensive basis. We're talking about a pandemic of irrationality, or what we in our book call bad thinking. Within our field of philosophy, the term epistemology refers to the study of knowledge. A philosopher concerned with epistemology seeks a theory of rationality. Such a theory will explain why some beliefs are justified and some not, as well as why some true beliefs qualify as knowledge and others do not. Although many issues within epistemology have become too abstract and technical for the non-specialist, 
Nearly every person can appreciate the importance of evidence in justifying a belief. We all can or should acknowledge that tea leaves or fortune cookies are bad reasons to believe something, whereas firsthand experience, rigorous experimentation, or the testimony of experts are good reasons. The epistemically stubborn person refuses to tailor his beliefs or her beliefs to the available evidence. They continue to believe, for instance, that the COVID-19 vaccine is dangerous, despite the wealth of evidence to the contrary. Typically, the fault is not ignorance of the facts. One would have to be living in a deep hole not to have been exposed to widespread reports of the coronavirus's danger and the vaccine's efficacy and safety. Rather, the problem is a stubborn refusal to see the facts as repudiating what one wants to believe. Epistemic stubbornness is its, own kind, is its own kind of disease and arguably even more dangerous than COVID-19. Yes, COVID-19 has in all too many cases been lethal, but epistemic stubbornness is the force driving a resistance to the very vaccines that would have prevented these deaths. In fact, epistemic stubbornness manifests itself across a broad spectrum of issues of the utmost importance. Here in the United States, we see epistemic stubbornness lying behind persistent but patently absurd claims that the election was stolen from Donald Trump. It's beyond doubt that the most recent presidential election was fair and that Trump lost. Justification for believing that Biden won the presidency fair and square is overwhelming. Those who deny this outcome are, like those opposed to the COVID-19 vaccine, probably not dumb or stupid, rather they're irrational in that Badly misled by cynical and self-serving politicians and pundits, they simply refuse to believe a conclusion to which the evidence so clearly points. They're governed not by reason, but by desire or passion. They simply want to believe that Trump won the election, and it is that desire, rather than evidence, that forms the basis of their belief. We see the same kind of epistemic stubbornness in the denial of climate change. Can the research data and many computer models that show the effect of fossil fuels on climate be mistaken? Can reports of melting glaciers, rising sea levels, increasingly violent storms, and extraordinarily hot temperatures all be a hoax? Epistemically stubborn people can be very creative in devising stories that deny the evidence. This is just another symptom of their disease. They settle on a proposition they want to believe, and refuse to accept evidence to its contrary. Can it be a coincidence that climate change denial is stronger among those who live in states that produce oil or coal? Familiarity with some basic philosophical concepts offers one possible treatment for epistemic stubbornness. A deeper understanding of why some beliefs are justified and some not, why some beliefs, even true ones, might nevertheless fall short of knowledge allows one to reflect more carefully on whether one should believe something. Perhaps even more usefully, a background in basic epistemology equips one to challenge others when you see that their beliefs lack proper support. Developing a theory of justification, knowledge, and their relationship is the main business of epistemology. To justify a belief, you must provide reasons for thinking that it's true. Being justified, however, is not the same as being true. A belief might be true, but unjustified. Suppose, for instance, you correctly believe that on this date, 100 years from now, it will be raining. Surely in this case, it's hard to imagine how one could truly be justified in a belief about a meteorological event so far in the future. Your belief happens to be true, though, despite being unjustified. Likewise, some false beliefs might enjoy tremendous justification. Just think, for example, of Newton's physics. For centuries, Newton's ideas about force and mass seemed so well confirmed that no one in their right mind could think that they were false. Yet we now know, with Einstein's help, that they are. Your belief at the very start of the 20th century that force is the product of mass and acceleration was justified, even though we now know it's false. Similarly, before Galileo's discoveries of the phases of Venus, the moons of Jupiter and other astronomical phenomena in the early 17th century, one would have been justified in believing that the sun and the other planets and stars revolved around the Earth. 
knowledge as epistemologists understand the concept is something like the sum of truth and justification. One can never know something that is false, nor can you claim to know something, even something true, without having justification for your belief. But we can put aside these somewhat abstract ruminations on concepts like justification and knowledge and focus on some real practical benefits that have emerged from the millennia that philosophers have spent thinking about them. As we try to understand how to be rational, how to ensure that one's beliefs are properly justified and most probably true, philosophers have sought to establish rules of good thinking. When lay people talk about arguments, they typically have in mind unpleasant confrontations. Philosophers, on the other hand, think of arguments as strategies for justifying a belief, almost like soccer coaches might think of set plays as strategies for scoring, or doctors might think of treatment plans as strategies for curing. And just as the good coach will recognize when the circumstances are right for this play, and the good doctor will understand when this rather than that treatment is appropriate, the good reasoner will appreciate when one kind of argument rather than another serves to justify a particular belief. The consequences of irrationality and bad thinking are not limited to what we happen to believe. What we believe and why we believe it matters greatly in a very practical way insofar as our actions are typically driven by our beliefs. Epistemic stubbornness is often accompanied by a kind of normative stubbornness. What we mean by this is that we all too often act without sufficient reflection on what we are doing and why we are doing it. This is especially apparent when it, becomes, when it comes to exercising authority and applying rules. Here are a couple of examples. In a high school in Madison, Wisconsin, a black security guard is dealing with a disruptive student who is also black. While being led away by the guard, the student is repeatedly calling him a racial slur. The guard tells the student several times, do not call me a N-word, using the actual word. The school district, however, has a zero tolerance, one strike and you're out policy governing the use of that word. It's a well-intentioned policy instituted to ensure a safe and respectful learning environment for a diverse body of students. Unfortunately, it is also a policy that the security guard appears purely as a technicality to have violated, and he is summarily fired by the principal. Although we should note that after a public outcry, the guard was later uh, reinstated. Here's the second example. At a cross-country meet in Ohio, a 16-year-old Muslim woman is disqualified for wearing a hijab during the race. She attends a private Muslim school but participates in athletics for the local public high school. Because her coach neglected to fill out before the race the proper paperwork for a religious clothing waiver, which she would have received as a matter of course, she is told by the race directors after the race that her headwear, though made by Nike brings her no competitive advantage, violates regulations governing athletic uniforms. She's disqualified, although she had run her personal best in the race. What we see in both of these cases is an overzealous, even thoughtless application of a rule. This normative stubbornness as a kind of autopilot rule following leads to what any reasonable person should regard as wrongheaded and even unjust treatment. The problem is that the rule enforcers are not thinking hard enough about what they're doing, and therefore they are acting unreasonably. What all such situations call for is not just a recognition that a particular rule applies to a particular set of circumstances, but something more, good judgment. Judgment is a matter of discretion. A discreet person knows when and when not to say or do something. She is good at assessing an individual or a situation and determining what is called for in word and deed. By contrast, an indiscreet person will typically say or do the wrong thing, something inappropriate or offensive. We all know indiscreet people, I think. Judgment in the moral sphere, where it involves action, is a matter of reasonable discrimination. 
A person with good judgment recognizes both what is typical and what is distinctive about the particular case at hand, and then notes whether what is distinctive is relevant. The teenage runner was indeed wearing a hijab for which her coach forgot to seek a waiver. What mattered was not the headscarf's brand or color or religious significance, but whether it gave her a competitive advantage, which it did not. Circumstances are everything. The police officer who declines to give a speeding ticket to a driver on his way to the hospital because his wife is in labor in the back seat is making a judgment call. Exercising judgment differs from either ignoring the rule or overlooking the facts and the infraction and in effect turning the other way. When we turn the other way, we are essentially refusing to make a judgment one way or the other and thereby abdicating responsibility. By contrast, judgment involves acknowledging that the rule has been broken, that the perpetrating party is technically guilty, but also making a conscious and deliberate choice not to enforce the rule. Just as important, and unlike turning the other way, you must be prepared, if challenged, to defend that choice with reasons. It is to recognize that the full application of the rule would result in an unjust or at least undesirable state of affairs. Knowing when a belief is justified and when it is not, tailoring your beliefs to the available and appropriate evidence, not holding on to a belief when it is clearly refuted by the facts, this is what it means to be epistemically rational. Exercising discretion in our actions, knowing what we are doing and why we are doing it, acting on our very best judgment, this is what it means to be practically or normatively rational. What it all comes down to is something that Socrates insisted on nearly two and a half millennia ago. In one of Plato's dialogues, Socrates insists that the unexamined life is not worth living for a human being. Socrates' idea of an unexamined life might seem easy enough to describe in a general way. It's the life of someone who never seriously questions things, least of all their own actions and plans. Such a person might indeed ask whether his actions or those of his friends or community or government are expedient or popular or profitable or even pleasant, but he does not or only rarely asks whether they are in fact good. The unexamined life is a life of moral and intellectual passivity. But what exactly is demanded in an examined life? At the very least, it requires a careful examination of one's action in the light of one's values and principles. You need to ask whether, given what you believe about right and wrong and good and bad, you need to ask whether what you are doing is the right thing or what you are pursuing is a good thing. You need to engage in reflection on the moral character of your actions. But that's only one stage of an examined life. Even more important is a second stage where you engage in reflection on and examination of just those values and principles themselves. This is where you ask, are my beliefs about what is right and good, true and justified? Do I truly know uh, do I truly know what is right and what is good? Or on the contrary, am I acting only on guesswork, a hunch, or some faith in what someone else might have told me or done? This kind of reflection on your moral thinking itself is crucial in the process of self-examination. And this brings us back to rationality and good thinking. For the most important part of the examined life is having knowledge of what you know and what you do not know. The opposite of epistemic stubbornness is epistemic humility. By this, we do not mean an under-evaluation of yourself in your epistemic condition. It does not mean any kind of self-deprecation. Rather, it means taking an accurate and fair assessment of where you stand, taking stock of your beliefs to see which are truly justified, and not thinking that you know what you do not really know. We open the book with a diagnosis of a serious problem, one that threatens our health 
but also the fabric of our society and even the existence of life on our planet. We'd like to close this presentation as we close the book with a prescription. What can we do to cure bad thinking and its various manifestations as epistemic and normative stubbornness? A good first step in dealing with irrationality in thought and action is simply to acknowledge its existence and its distinctness from other deficiencies like ignorance and stupidity. There is, after all, no easy cure for stupidity. As philosophers and academics, we place our hope in education. Instruction in philosophy, and the earlier one is exposed to it, the better, can only deepen one's understanding of how reasoning works, how good evidence differs from bad, how premises support a conclusion, and how to form and maintain or give up beliefs in a rational manner. Philosophers have long been devoted to cataloging and examining a variety of argument forms. What are good and valid ways to argue for something, for the truth of some thesis? And what are bad, invalid, or fallacious ways? These efforts are not undertaken merely as an intellectual exercise, a pursuit of pleasure of the kind that a challenging Sudoku game might, might deliver. Philosophers understand that rational belief, belief that rests on a solid ground of justification, is our best hope for living good, comfortable, healthy lives in a healthy environment. The discoveries that have improved our lives, and not just things like medicines and technologies, but also ideas about sound governance, justice, and civil rights, grew from arguments of just the sort that philosophical training prepares one to evaluate. This brings us to our next point. Apart from its focus on reasons, justification, and rationality, philosophy imparts a different kind of wisdom as well. We can learn from philosophy what it means to live an examined life, a life in which one takes the trouble to discover what one really does and does not know, a life of epistemic humility that reflects values that lead not just to personal fulfillment and equanimity, rather than resentment and hatred, but to reasonable approaches to social, political, and environmental problems. So we'd like to close our presentation this evening by, by broadening our perspective a little bit. Um, we've been emphasizing the role that philosophy might play in curbing epistemic stubbornness, but we would be remiss in not recognizing the importance of the humanities more generally in teaching young minds how to think critically. And I should say elder minds as well. At a recent gathering of parents of incoming students at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, one parent asked how given the cost of tuition, she could possibly justify her daughter taking classes in ancient Greek or modern art or medieval philosophy or other quote unquote frivolous subjects, rather than courses that will directly help her in her career goals. There is an easy reply to that parent and it's this, if you're paying that much money in tuition, you better hope that your daughter or son is taking such humanities courses and science courses and arts courses. After all, you're sending her to a major university, not a technical college or vocational school. How in fact could you justify spending the money to send her here and not have her take advantage of everything a university has to offer? This parent's underappreciation of the value of the humanities in her student's education may seem relatively harmless. After all, the student was going to take what she wanted to take no matter what, or perhaps in spite of what her parents wanted. But in fact, it reflects a larger, very public distrust of and even onslaught against the humanities on our campuses. Universities and colleges are cutting back humanities departments, either by consolidating them, dropping majors, or eliminating departments altogether. To take just our own discipline, philosophy, Ithaca College, Guilford College, Western Oregon University, Cabrini College, Southwest Baptist University, Rockford University, among other schools, have all eliminated their philosophy majors. Claremont, Gradu Claremont Graduate University closed its department, and the discipline is currently under threat elsewhere, including Ohio University, the State University of New York and Fredonia, Mills College, Missouri Western, and St. Cloud State and the list seems to grow weekly. 
The defense of the humanities typically takes the form of an appeal to the way in which its disciplines, quote, mold young minds or foster critical thinking and make for enlightened citizenship. Platitudes, one and all, but no less true for their generality. And when we consider what exactly it is that students acquire in their humanities courses, an ability to make sense of texts, events, and works of creativity, the skill to communicate their thoughts in a clear and compelling manner, an informed and analytical understanding of our historical, political, economic, and ecological situation, it's not difficult to see just how philosophy, history, literary and cultural studies, and art history contribute to preparing young people for being intelligent and responsible citizens. But the danger of cutting back on the humanities must be even clearer in light of events over the past two years. Again, consider that even the most elementary philosophy courses, one teaches one how to tell a valid argument from an invalid one how to evaluate a theory or proposition in relation to the available evidence, how not to fall for mistaken analogies, in short, how to avoid bad thinking. What could be more valuable at a time when people believe the craziest things, that vaccines cause autism, that 5G networks are the source of the COVID pandemic, that our most recent presidential election was stolen, that one of our political parties is under the control of a cabal engaged in human trafficking and a child sex ring. Okay, that one might be true. No one leading an examined life could possibly believe that the Holocaust never occurred or that President Biden won the election through deep state manipulation and massive voter fraud. A person educated in the basic lessons of philosophy, history, and other humanistic disciplines would recognize the value of getting vaccinated against the COVID-19 virus for their own health and the health of others, and even for our national economic and political well-being. What we should be asking then is not how a student today can justify taking courses in philosophy or classics or art history or li Russian literature. Rather, the real question is, how can an institution of higher education justify calling itself a university or a liberal arts college if it's going to gut its humanities offerings. If the goal of undergraduate education is to create better thinkers, make students more skeptical, more capacious, in short, more wise, then our legislatures and boards of regents and trustees should be concerned with strengthening the humanities, not killing them. Thank you for uh, listening to our presentation of our book. Uh, you're muted, Janie. There we go. I'm going to get everybody back here on screen. Um, although I don't have you back on here yet. Hang on a minute. There's Larry. He should be back on. There's Larry. Uh, Stephen, why do we only have you as a strange looking alien? Hmm. He sometimes turns into an alien. <laughs> uh, um, have there fun. Okay. Uh, so, this was a, a really interesting, um, there we go. Um, little glitches, technology. Um, I really love your um, statements about the importance of not just philosophy, but of the humanities in, in higher education. And um, for those of you who uh, maybe are tuning in from elsewhere other than Princeton in general. Um, so the Princeton Public Library, and we're the host of this event. And we said, this is funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities at the beginning. And so one of the things uh, our library took upon itself um, almost 10 years ago now was to create a model in, in public libraries for teaching and, and in strengthening the humanities in communities. And so this event was actually um, organized by our humanities specialist, uh, Madeline Rosenberg, who couldn't be here tonight. Um, I was one of the people though who I, I supervised Madeline, who helped write this grant. And we actually have an endow a specialized endowment from the um, National Endowment for the humanities to have a humanities specialist on staff who has a master's in public humanities as well as a master's in history or philosophy or so a dual master's person on our public library staff and this is why we do programs such as this to strengthen humanities for those who have all stages of life um, who have maybe gone on past um, 
college or whatever. And we regularly have lectures about philosophy and humanities. And so, you know, what you're saying is so true that this is needed. And I agree it's needed at the university level, but it's also needed for people who maybe didn't have the chance to study humanities themselves when they were at university. And we did a, a five part philosophy lecture series at the library, a lunchtime series. And we had 40 to 50 people coming out at lunchtime to learn more about philosophy because they had never had the chance when they were younger. And you're right, the teaching of how to think and how to be critical is needed more than ever. Um, so when you started writing this book, so did you, what was the impetus that actually, I mean, it wasn't the, the COVID vaccine denier. So what was the impetus to writing this book? I would say it was overdetermined. Um, it was four years of lies and cynical manipulation of people coming out of the White House. It was the ways in which democracy seemed to be under threat around the world, in Hungary and Brazil, in the United States and elsewhere, as a result of, of, of falsehoods, of people's credulity. Um, and of course, you know, there are many explanations. And I'm looking at the, the first question that was put up there. Why do people believe these things that, that don't have any justification? You know, in some cases, it's perfectly understandable. People are hurting economically, they're angry, and they're looking for some comfort. And I mean, maybe we should leave it to psychologists to explain why people um, come around to believing things for which there's no justification. Um, and I think no matter how much philosophy you have, people will continue to uh, be affected by their passions, their emotions, uh, by their needs. Um, but we're hoping that at least uh, philosophy can reduce uh, the number of things that we take on as our beliefs without justification. I, I was also motivated by the, the amount of misinformation that is spreading across social media and right-wing uh, television. And if you read any of this stuff, it's so obviously false and so easily refuted that I began to wonder what's wrong with these people who are unable to, to think themselves out of uh, these ridiculous sorts of claims. Uh, and so our, our book was in part uh, a uh, response, response to this sort of bad thinking that is more and more present every day. Okay. Um, I, I really like this question here. Could it be because people are raised to believe in religions we should not base their beliefs on evidence, but rather on faith. So if there were no religion, would people be less likely to believe untrue things? I don't think so. Um, you know, I don't know how many of the people who assaulted the Capitol building on January 6th were or were not religious. I, th I think religion, as long as the person who is a member of a religious community recognizes that their religious beliefs are not knowledge, but faith. I think it's perfectly fine. Um, and the ability to distinguish things we come to believe on faith versus things we come to believe in a rational manner is an important one here. Um, claims involving the existence of God, the nature of God, providence and such matters, um, they can be perfectly harmless and in fact beneficial if they bring comfort, just as long as people recognize that these are not justified knowledge claims. Larry, this is right up your alley because you're- Yeah, I mean, I, mean I, I, I agree pretty much with what Steve said, although I would note that uh, many people who uh, uh, believe in God think that there is a rational basis for their belief in God. I, I think that's wrong. Um, I think there is not a rational basis in God. But, uh, and so if you think you're rationally justified in believing in God, I, I would I would say that's an instance of, of bad thinking. But on the other hand, that in itself doesn't mean that you ought not to believe in God because there are a bunch of different oughts that uh, prescribe the kinds of beliefs you should hold. And it, it could be that uh, you have very good prudential reasons for believing in God. Uh, and uh, that sort of belief, I think, is, is, is innocent in a way that um, a, a claim to rationally believe in God is not. Okay. Um, oopsie. Okay, so there, here's a devil's advocate question mm -hmm. coming in. Is it possible the problem is less one of irrationality and more one of mistrust and cynicism about traditional sources of authority? So is it is it more this mistrust than um, being irrational? 
I think for a lot of conspiracy theorists, there is this element of mistrust. They think that you know, the government is going to use vaccines to plant microchips into their brains so they can be tracked. Uh, certain members of African-American community have actually pretty good reason to distrust uh, medical authorities given uh, a, a history of uh, abuse by these very authorities. So I think there is a, a deep streak of cynicism and mistrust that uh, is forming a basis of things like uh, vaccine rejection. But on the other hand, I think while some distrust is actually healthy, uh, the quantity of evidence that's now available to demonstrate the safety of the vaccines and the reality of the threat of COVID is, is so, there's just so much evidence now that um, distrust should not, you should not allow your distrust to, uh, to form, form your beliefs about these things. I, I like this question because it really uh, compels us to introduce an important distinction um, mistrust and cynicism are fine if they're justified. If your mistrust and cynicism is based in the total absence of evidence, then it's just another instance of bad thinking. Uh, moreover, we want to distinguish between those who are um, subject to bad thinking in giving credence to beliefs without justification versus those who know better but nonetheless encourage and foster that that kind of mistrust and cynicism. And I'm talking about people, I'll, I'll go, you know, might as well be honest about this, um, pundits on Fox News who must surely know that the things they are saying are so often false, and yet they continue to pursue um, these, these statements and generate mistrust and cynicism, which is unjustified. So if, if the mistrust and cynicism is well-grounded in evidence, good. If it's not, it's just another instance of bad thinking. And yet, you know, and, and the one that really um, gets to me, and I just saw another video today on social media of a nurse who, a nurse of 10 years who just allowed herself to get fired from her job because as she said, she wouldn't take the jab, but her justification is medical freedom. And that, so, you know, it's about, so I think a lot of people now are realizing that their irrational thoughts are irrational, but so now they're gonna just take up the cause of freedom. But now they don't understand what freedom is, right? You don't. Well, you don't have the freedom to drive drunk. You may want to drive drunk, but you don't have the freedom to drive drunk and not just because you might hurt yourself, uh, but because you're putting others in danger. Uh, so freedom is not the, um, the ability to do whatever you want, regardless of what you're doing, regardless of the harm your actions might have on others. Yeah, I just, the, the fact that medical professionals are, are denying taking this vaccine just uh, doesn't seem that. Um, okay, it is. So we have uh, Ginny here who is suggesting that we start teaching critical thinking and philosophy in elementary and high school, and maybe even in a simple way in preschool. So how could how could is that being how could we get that to happen? I think that's absolutely right. Um, there are ways of there are quite a few high schools that teach philosophy and do a very good job at it, um, and many of the lessons of philosophy and good thinking are just so simple that a five-year-old can grasp it. In fact, the five-year-old will recognize that that's, that's just how they think ordinarily and all we're doing is, is revealing to them. Uh, no one's better at asking why than a, than a toddler. <laughs> and so I think philosophy channels that why impulse um, and in a way gives it, um, gives it a greater articulateness. Um, I, absolutely, I think this is the way to go. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Um... So I don't see any other questions. Um, so why don't we, we I mean, um, these programs generally run about 45 minutes and we're heading up to that that mark. So if you guys wanna have any closing comments about um, your book or um, anything else that you need to say to us tonight. So, you know, it sometimes the book might seem to be just a long litany of complaints. Uh, in fact, I, I think we're quite hopeful. Uh, as philosophers, we felt that you know, the least we could do, uh, and maybe the most we could do, is write a book like this. And hopefully, um, we don't expect everyone all of a sudden to become rational. And maybe the people who most need to read the book are the least likely to read it. But at least people out there will know people who could benefit um, from reading it. And if they're not going to read it themselves, at least um, engage in conversations with others and try to foster um, 
if not more rational beliefs, at least a more rational and collegial discourse. Yeah, I'd just like to say, um, although Steve and I enjoyed writing the book, it's a it's a book, I can't speak for Steve, but it's a book I wish I didn't feel like I had to write. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I, I, I think it, it, it's a book that, you know, it's, it's one of these sorts of books where you hope very much that um, it gets into the hands of the people who we think can benefit most from it. Yeah. Uh, and, and short of that, we hope it gets in, into the hands of people who are just sort of invested in um, trying to ar articulate principles and methods for thinking clearly that might, that might influence others who, who need these lessons even more. Yeah, thank you so much. I mean, I do think that the gaslighting that's gone on for this nation for the last four years, and um, I don't know if you can tell, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Canadian, my accent sometimes gives me away, and I was just home to Canada for the first time in two years because of the pandemic. And um, some of this, what's been happening down here in the United States is creeping across into Canada. They were in the midst of an election cycle while I was there. And I was very, very surprised by some of the ways that what has happened in here in the United States over the last four years has made its way north across the border. And you're right, I think, you know, it's, it is spreading around the globe and it needs to be, it needs to be tackled head on. So thank you for writing this book. I think it's really important. And I do hope it finds its way into the hands of the people that need it most and, and, and into the hands of teachers who are teaching and, and can and pass those lessons on to the younger generation and make sure that they learn how to think critically as well. It'll so make a great Hanukkah gift and stocking stuffer. That's what I yes, have. it is a great Hanukkah gift and stocking stuffer. And, um, you know, thank you for being an advocate for the humanities and for, for critical thinking. Uh, as a information professional, I really appreciate that. And so does our library. And thank you for taking time to be here tonight. And thank you to our audience for your great questions. And so we're going to say good night. Okay. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night.